Hello guys, Winston here. As a hobby CNC guy, I've always been jealous of all the professional machinists who run CNCs big enough to stick a GoPro in. Having a camera that follows the spindle or the table is really both an interesting and a useful perspective on a machine where both are moving. Time lapses on the Shapeoko aren't that bad because the part remains stationary while the gantry moves, but accelerating footage of the Nomad results in something that can be mildly nauseating at best. If you put a GoPro on a Nomad though, the focal distance of the camera exceeds the depth of the table. You can't realistically film anything closer than about a foot with the stock lens. Everything that's closer will come out blurry. Macro filters can fix this, however, filters that are designed specifically for the GoPro are much more expensive due to the non-standard platform and mounting requirements. Standard filters that thread onto 52, 55, or 58mm lenses are way cheaper, so if I could make an adapter for my GoPro, that would open up a whole ecosystem of accessories for it, so that's what I set out to do. In Fusion 360, I designed a plate that would fit around the GoPro's prominent lens assembly. It consisted of a circle that would form the mounting flange for a macro filter, and an offset rectangle that would provide an interface for attaching the adapter with double-sided tape to the body of the GoPro. On the back side of the adapter, I had to design in additional channels to work around the geometry of the case, which doesn't stop flush with the face of the GoPro. I also needed to add a fillet around the lens opening to match the one on the GoPro. In the manufacturing workspace, I started off as I often do with a 3D adaptive clear to remove the bulk of my material. My typical recipe on the Nomad these days is to use about 12 thou radial stock to leave and about 6 to 8 thou of axial stock to leave on a roughing operation. 10,000 RPM, 30 inches per minute, 10 to 12 thou optimal load, 30 thou depth of cut. After that, I would use a combination of light contouring and pocketing toolpaths to clean up the walls and floors respectively. Mostly, this is to achieve a consistent surface finish on the walls for aesthetic reasons. The only dimension that's critical is the cylindrical face that will be thread milled for the macro filter. I added a chamfering operation to all the exposed edges, being mindful of tool collisions with the model. And finally, I had to figure out what my thread milling parameters would be. John Saunders has a great spreadsheet to help you figure out those nominal parameters, but camera lens threads are kind of uncharted territory, there's not as much documentation about them out there. This is a 52mm thread with a 0.75mm pitch, I couldn't find any information beyond that on the internet, so I guesstimated the best I could. Based on the minor dimension of the externally threaded part of the filter, I figured the internal bore of my adapter had to have a minimum diameter of about 51mm. And based on the major dimension I observed, I knew the grooves of my thread had to cut into the walls of my adapter by at least 0.34mm, but just to be safe I'd cut a full half millimeter into my walls to reach a nominal diameter of 52mm. This made my pitch diameter offset 1mm. After plugging in those values, I also had to adjust my bottom depth so that my thread mill wouldn't hit the lip that I modeled to ensure I could reference off the vertical faces of the GoPro's lens protrusion. And that was basically all I needed to do for the front face. On my Nomad, I set up a piece of quarter-inch aluminum using double-sided tape. With a 2mm single flute end mill in place, I started cutting. This initial batch of operations went really well, and I was pretty happy with the surface finishes I was getting. However, after the 2mm end mill had finished running, and I tried to remove the additional stock material from the bed to make room for my chamfer cutter, a strip of tape that had remained unbroken by my dead perfect depth of cut pulled my piece off the bed of the Nomad along with the bigger plate. With my positional reference lost, I had to machine a custom pocket in which to fixture my prematurely liberated adapter. The plate stock went back on the machine and I cut a pocket that was exactly the same shape as my adapter. This was a really shallow pocket because I needed some vertical clearance for my chamfer up. It was a little too tight initially so I crept up on a free fit by adding negative stock to leave on my last contour toolpath. After resecuring my adapter with double-sided tape, I ran my chamfer toolpath, and here I'm using a proper chamfering tool for the first time. This one's from X-Edge Tools, and it's so much more of a pleasure to use than the 90 degree engraving bits and router style V-bits I've used for this task before. Having a tip diameter that's known precisely, cutting with flutes that have a bit of rake angle and helix, and leveraging the diameter of the tool for better surface speed all seem to make a positive difference in the quality of my chamfer. And then it was time for the operation that I had been dreading the most, thread milling. I was talking with Rob about this upstairs and he jokingly asked how many thread mills I had. When I said two, he offered me the one in the shop for when I inevitably broke both of mine. His pessimism was severely compromising my emotional energy field so I went back downstairs to purge myself of Rob's negativity and loaded up my thread mill in the Nomad. I hit start and crossed my fingers in one hand and hovered over the feed rate override with the other. 
Pausing the operation will not save you here because once the thread mill bites into the walls, you can't retract it without breaking the tool. So I started slow and bumped things up as I gained confidence in the cut. Thankfully, there were no crashes and my thread mill lived to cut again. I apprehensively tried to thread my macro filter onto the adapter and was shocked when it screwed on smoothly. It's one of the most satisfying feelings as a machinist, seeing your part function as designed and nailing a new thread profile on the first try without any math, and that's pretty awesome. In your face, Rob. With the front side completed, I now had to do a little machining on the back side. The GoPro skeleton case isn't perfectly flush with the surface of the GoPro's body, so my adapter needs channels in the back to provide clearance for the case. I also need to round over my corners to get around the fillet at the base of the lens. Using a combination of square and ball end mills, I added the necessary features. Then, upon reflection, I decided to add a little personalized touch to the front of the adapter. With the addition of some double-sided tape to mount my adapter to the GoPro, I was in business. This was a really fun technical exercise, especially with having to locate and fixture my part multiple times. But if I had to do it again, I, I, I really hate to admit it, but I'd probably just 3D print it. There, I said it. The truth is, this part doesn't need to be super strong, so there's no reason it can't be made from plastic. But it does look really good in aluminum, almost as good as that awesome shirt with my logo on it, available now on Store Frontier, link in the description below. Look guys, if I'm going to stoop down to the level of recommending 3D printing, I might as well also shamelessly plug some merch, right? Anyway, back on topic, this adapter works really well, and it looks darn good. The only downside is that I can't easily remove the GoPro from its case, so I'm downloading all my footage via USB. A quick release option is something I'll consider in a future iteration. In the meantime, I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects.